on Zoom, we're good? Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce John Paul Clark. He is uh, currently at uh, UT Austin, and I'm going to go ahead and read the, the brief blip bits here. This is actually pretty short, so I don't have to summarize. Uh, so currently professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at UT Austin, um, holds the Ernest Cockrell Jr. Memorial Chair in Engineering. He's also previously been a faculty member at Georgia Tech and MIT. He's the vice president for strategic technologies at United Technology, or has been. That was in the past, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now it's RTX and has been a researcher in the past at Boeing and NASA JPL. So broad spectrum, works in both aviation and in space, um, but primarily in autonomy kinds of things. Um, so he's an expert in development and use of stochastic models and optimization algorithms to improve the efficiency and robustness of complex systems with a focus on aviation. Okay, so I'm reading that verbatim, but I'm sure you're gonna talk about various parts of that. Um, and uh, I think it's good to hear some of the applications here. So. Uh, led to the development of the world's first fully autopilot coupled a t continuous descent arrival procedure. Sorry, I could not memorize that, so I, I had to actually read that one out. Um, to be used in daily operations, airline schedules that are robust to poor weather and or aircraft failures, which if you've ever looked into those kinds of applications are a huge challenge because of just all of the constraint and just all the number of airplanes and all the things going on. Um, and a state-of-the-art algorithm to maximize likelihood of success for a portfolio of research and development projects or financial assets with uncertain future performance and schedule. So basically predicting things when there's a lot of uncertainty. Yes, right. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Christy. Pleasure to be here and to see some old friends and meet new friends. Um, can you hear me on the, we're all good? Do I don't have to sing one, two, three, four, five, six again? No singing allowed anymore? So again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I could talk about a lot of things. Uh, last summer I was talking about um, hydrogen powered airplanes, uh, which was one of the companies I found, Universal Hydrogen, but I'm not talking about hydrogen today. So I'm talking about autonomy, which is another subject which is near and dear to my heart. And it's something that I, I think um, uh, needs a, a critical look by all of us, especially those in the controls community as well as those in the CS community about how we are really, really going to move this to the aviation because it's a big challenge. And I'm, I hope I will convince you how much of a challenge this is and give you some food for thought. And I'm going to show you one example, which I think is quite instructive as a, of a way to deal with this um, problem. So, yes, I, oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, we're working on it. You know, we got our G1 paper. Uh, from the FAA for our um, airplane. And for those of you who don't know, G1 is the paper that you agree with the federal, with the agency about the terms under which you're going to certify the airplane. And so the next is the G2, which is the means by which you're going to meet those, and we're working on that. But things are going well. And I got my second patent of the year from Universal Hydrogen, so that was kind of cool. But anyway, we're not talking about hydrogen today. We're talking about autonomy. And, and what you see here is a slide which I, 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 I borrowed from NASA, um, which I feel like I can do because I'm the chair of the aeronautics committee, so I feel I can borrow that sometimes. Um, showing a vision of the future of aviation, which I think, as I was saying earlier to Ed, is probably the thing I am most grateful for because eVTOLs and UAVs have brought a huge excitement in the aviation world. Um, more excitement than we've had in the 10 years before these things came to the fore. And so what you see here, are you know, many vehicles going from point to point, some um, like Uber Pool, gathering people at, at point and delivering them a point where they get distributed. Also, you have autonomy in the cockpits, et cetera, of airplanes. And you, know, you can see a lot of issues, right? Clearly, you're going to have multipath if you're a GPS person and a sensing person. You're going to have blockages of comms, et cetera, by all these buildings operating in urban and suburban environments. And so it's a challenge, and autonomy is an enabler because to get all this to work, we're going to need aircraft with greater autonomy. As many of you heard just this week, the FAA reauthorization bill, which happens every, I think, 10 years, has been held up because of the 1500 rule, our rule. So after the Kogan Air accident in New York, Congress basically implemented a rule that says all sort of regional aircraft pilots had to have 1,500 hours, basically equivalent of an ATP certificate, before they could operate. What that did, it raised the bar for the entry level 
into the regional carriers, and there has not been an increase in the back end in training in terms of numbers to match that. So we are pay, facing a pilot shortage, and so the argument now is how much of the 1,500 hours is going to be allowed in, search, in simulator versus not, et cetera, to try to actually get more pilots in seats, in cockpits. And so autonomy is a way for us to deal with that pilot shortage. How, I know, how that will be, that's up for debate. On the air traffic control side, we equally have probably heard about the shortage of air traffic controllers um, and basically putting a, um, um, a, a, a limit on the kind of traffic, amount of traffic you can have at airports. Again, autonomy there. And of course, the, you know, there's a proliferation of vertiports. Nobody likes their neighbor um, bringing their eVTOL next door to them. So you're going to have noise complaints, privacy. Nobody wants to see what, them to see what you're doing in the backyard. And everybody gets risk averse when vehicles start flying over their heads, right? And then new certification standards are required, which is the thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about here um, when we get here. By the way, this is a report from 2014, which I was a co-author of because I was co-chair of the committee, which basically set the research agenda for autonomy in civil aviation. So it's always a nice thing to go back to. So first question, and it's the old professor's trick, as the professors in the room know, is, what is something, go back to the dictionary, right? Because it's always a good thing. And so they ask the question, what is autonomy? And if you look at the Webster's Dictionary, you'll see that autonomy is the quality of state of being self-governed. Um, here's a great example from ancient Greece about democracy. I will leave the debate about whether that's a viable way forward to another time and another location. But the point about it is that autonomy has to be self-governance, right? And so what we see in the world is that, hey, good to see you. Hey, all right, sorry. All right, so in the, in the automobile world, um, the SAE has, and others in the automobile world, have basically created multiple levels of autonomy. And they go from Z, level zero to level five, where level zero is uh, no, automation, no automation at all. And then for autonomy, um, vehicles completely driverless. But if you look in the fine details, what you see is the vehicle, when you get to that level, it's all about operating without sup human supervision or intervention. And so the focus is on automation and independent performance of well-defined functions. And a number of folks have been working on things about, you know, proving that the algorithms that you put in place, a priori proofs, that they'll behave a certain way under certain conditions. But the truth of the matter is, it's all about, mostly about execution. And so similarly on the space side, um, I'm teaching a class on systems architecting and they're doing a space project. Anybody's interested, they can listen to the brief out. Where we're looking at the architecture for what's called Endurance R, which is the robotic option for a proposed mission to the moon, where they're going to basically collect samples from the South Pole, right, which is the dark side of the moon. And what you see here is that the, the, the robot will actually start and then traverse all the way through the, the, the um, so this is R, Poincare, and go here all the way to Apollo. And the, and the robot will be programmed. And so anybody who's done any work in space autonomy knows it's a lot of move an inch and wait a day. Oh, that's what it really is, right? So you get some data. You send it down when you can. Hundreds of people gather around, either all in one place or virtually are connected. They make decisions about where to go next, and they send up a signal for you to move a few inches. And then they collect some more data, and then you wait not another day. And so there's long periods of time where the robot could be doing something useful, but because there's such a high uncertainty about wh what was going to happen if they move in a certain direction or not, They'd much rather keep, be safe, right, and keep the robot stationary while they decide what to do next. And so there's opportunity there for uh, um, autonomy to basically do something if you can show that it will remain safe. And, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about that later. So again, focus is on automation and independent performance of very well-defined functions in this case, right? So we've done that in aviation as well. And we have followed a similar path, where we started on the far left with what was taking the bridge of a, a ship 
and putting it in an airplane. So you can see, hold on, let me see if the laser is there. This is the Boeing 314, which very much looks like the bridge of a ship. It's quite spacious, right? You had five people in there, a captain, a co-captain, or co-pilot, sorry. You had a navigator, a radio operator, and an engineer, right? Everybody was doing a different function, and, you know, they, they all worked together. And then... After a while, we had the first, by the way, this chart I created when I was on my little sabbatical at UTC, so it has a lot of Collins Aerospace-related inventions on the chart. I mean, there are others too, but. So we had the first auto-tune radio invented by Collins in 1934. And then we had the Loran system, which is the basically a system for helping you to basically locate yourself. Positioning system is the precursor to GPS, um, but it's a terrestrial-based um, system-based well, it's triangulation, like every system like that is. And so what you found happening is by the time you got to the, um, in the late 40s, you find middle 40s, somebody went. We went from five to four. Which one do you think went first? Radio the radio operator, yes, exactly. Because you had auto-tune radio. You didn't need somebody turning dials to try to find this channel there. And then later on, People realized, hey, we got this new navigation. We had the popularization of IMUs and other kind of systems. And you had Omega bringing, brought into system for long-range navigation. So we could get rid of the navigator. And that's left us with three. Captain, co-pilot, and the flight engineer. That was a good thing because we had somebody to vote the captain off the, the, the ship if the captain went haywire, right? Because it's good parity testing to have triple redundancy. And so even though we had you know, inertial navigation system, we had CAT3 certified, we had FADEC, which basically had fully digital engine control, automatic digital engine control. It wasn't until the 80s when we actually figured out crew resource management rules and figured out that we could actually have two people working as a team and be safe. And we didn't need to have to worry about two people being able to control the one person that goes off the reservation, that we went to two. And we've been that way because now we have fully digital cockpits. Things are all glass cockpits in the major carriers, et cetera. We don't need that. Now we're at the point where we want to go to either one or two. Now the question is, should it be a, a human and a dog or nobody at all? You know the joke about the human and the dog? Yeah, the, 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 but the human to intervene if there's an issue, the dog to bite the human if they try to make sure it really has to intervene. And then, of course, there's none, which basically means you have the autonomy in place. But the bottom line is, we've got all of that with a significant reduction in accidents, right, to see how incredibly we've done. But in all of these, it's all about automation. I know I've never said anything yet about autonomy. So most people consider autonomy, if a system can complete a specific task, without human intervention. And we can look at things like the DARPA Grand Challenge, which is a very, has been, was a very popular thing in engineering and other things. But again, these are all operational decisions that are made using rules that are prescribed. But remember what we said at the beginning. What is autonomy? It's self-governance. Self-governance requires decision-making, autonomous decision-making. And so full autonomy requires both what we call autonomous decision-making and autonomous operation. So I created this quadrant. I wanted to call it the Clark Quadrant, but I wasn't that bold. So I just called it the Autonomy Quadrant, which basically says, when I'm thinking about an autonomous system, the question is, it, is it one of four categories? And the categories are who's making decision and who's acting. All right. So the first one, this is an example, instance one of clearly something where decisions are being made by the human and the human is acting. And then you like parasailing or anything like that. You know, there's no automation here, there's no autonomy. It's you, the vehicle, and you're on the winds. And you're riding it, you're making decisions. Instance two, the human is making decision and the automation is actually executing. And this is the classic flight management system in an airplane. You specify your trajectory by a bunch of points and the other pilot and the flight management system basically follow your trajectory and join the dots and do all the things to get to it. Now, you think about instance three. What's that example? Well, that's a very popular example. It's a TCAS, 
right? Where the two machines in the airplane, and ACAS-X is the current uh, version of that, actually negotiate, you climb, you go down. I'll go down, you will climb, or I'll go to the left, or you go to the right. And then it's the job of the human, otherwise known as the meat servo, to actually execute. And when the human doesn't execute, that leads to bad things. Like in Poland, there was a famous accident where the TCAS told them one to climb and the other, and the air traffic controller said no, and the Russian pilot, who had not been very um, well briefed about flying in the Western world, listened to the controller and led to an accident. It's a case where the machines decide, humans act. So the question then is, what's instance for? I'm still coming up with a working on a great example in aviation for instance for. Maybe we can create it together. The bottom line is, autonomous decision making is, is really decision making is hard to define, but easily to see. So I have this question, it's called the three o'clock in the morning question, which I always tell my students in the class. There are some things that are three o'clock in the morning knowledge and some things that are not. Right, somebody wakes you up, you're the engineer on an autonomous system, describes the internal state and the external operating environment and asks you what the system will do. If you know the answer, this is clearly autonomous operation. If you don't know the answer to 100% certain, this is autonomous decision making because the system is actually, based on its own learnings, which you are not aware of, making decisions that are different, right? Which is the big challenge because I'm um, sorry, autonomous is, is decision making in the presence of uncertainties that are informed by the experiences of the agent, right, which is the real challenge. And not because I do stochastic programming, but it's always nice when you have a hammer and it looks like a nail and it feels like a nail. Stochastic programming by an agent that learns, right? And so, to my mind, this is the approach that we could take to, to, to solve this problem. Now, the, chin there is, the problem is now, the FAA has yet to certify a non-deterministic system. Certification is really hard, right? Because the FAA wants to know that if you do A, at all instances and all times, you're going to get B. And I just said, hey, somebody wakes me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I designed a system and they tell me what's going on, and I'm not 100% certain what the system, that will not fly. At least, at the beginning, it won't fly. But the FAA certifies non-determinist systems all the time. It's just that they don't do it within this context all the time. So, for example, when we have something called ETOPS, everybody know what ETOPS is? So, ETOPS is Extended Twin Engine Operations. And that means that you're 777 and you're 787 and you're A350 and all those twin engine airplanes that fly over oceans or away from a nice cushy landing site have to have what they call an ETOP certification and that's specified in number of minutes. <coughs> and the number of minutes you can be away from a suitable landing site or how far away from a suitable landing site you can be in minutes is determined based on the probability and having 99.999 whatever confidence that both engines will not fail within two hours of each other. So if you have that level of confidence that the second engine won't fail and you know that the airplane can make it to a destination within two hours, you can give them an ETOPS certification for two hours. And what that means is if I'm doing a flight planning, I just basically put two hour circles around all the possible landing sites, and as long as I stay, I'm always in one circle, I'm good, right? So you don't just start with the ETOPS because you need statistics. So when the first airplanes came out, they basically limit them to fly over land until they got enough statistics. And then once they proved that that engine was reliable, then they gave them 60 minutes, and then 120, and then 180, and then 240, and now they have the equivalent of unlimited, meaning that you can fly anywhere in the world because it's a big, higher enough than 240 that you'll always be within a landing site, okay? So we have clear bases for that, for determining and certifying a system based on statistics. We don't think about it when we're thinking about the aircraft level components, but we do it at the system level. We do the same thing in landings. Nobody goes and do missed approach criteria 
they actually do Monte Carlo simulations to determine whether that landing height is the appropriate landing height for the equipment that you have around the airport. So there's a whole plethora of solutions and certification for dealing with stochastic systems that the FAA has used and has approved that could be deployed for this problem. So the, in, in the, thing, the problem with FAA is when they think about flight controls and autonomy, the world is, real world is stochastic. There's no finite set of operating conditions that you can test against. So we cannot always guarantee that a system is going to be optimal because we can't even enumerate the space, the state action set. And so the question then is, are there things that we can learn from the way we certify humans? Because, in case you didn't know, humans are inherently stochastic, right? But we certify them every day. And the simplest one for those who are parents is this curve, which is a notional curve, which shows the trust you have in your decision making of your child and the level of autonomous operation that you allow them, right? And so what you see here that trust is a leading indicator of autonomous operation, right? No, the other thing that's fun to see is that your parents never ever trust you 100%, but they just legally are allowed to give you autonomous operation of a certain time, right? But the point is, when your kid is very small, whether or not you actually take off the magnetic lock on the cabinets or the covers for the sockets based on some measure of, do you think this kid is clueful or clueless? Right? And after you determine that they're clueful, then you free things up. Now, when you get here and you determine whether to get on the car keys, that's a whole lot of battle together about how much trust that you have. But the question that you ask yourself, and this, it, while funny, this leads to an interesting question. How do you measure trust? Right? It's not a state action peer. Nobody sits with their kid and says, okay, in this situation, what will you do? <laughs> we don't do that. We actually measure their decision-making ability, as it should be, because we're trying to develop trust in their decision-making. And the same is true in the Army or the military. Nobody trusts a private. You tell a private, do exactly this. Don't, well, you were in there. You, you don't trust a private, you tell them exactly what to do, and if they don't do it, you whack them over the head. Not quite, but you penalize them. But as they develop to be a sergeant, and you have observances of their decision-making ability and their judgment, then you give a sergeant, you tell them, sergeant, I need you to take that hill. I'll give an army examples, because they're easier to do. And the, the, you leave it to the sergeant to figure out how to take that hill. And then ultimately, as you get even more, ideally, trust in decision making, you go to a four-star general, you don't tell the four-star general how to fight the battle and which order of battle to do. You tell them, here's my overall objectives, you figure it out, okay? And there's actually an interesting thing which I probably sh I should have said in a slide, which I've been lo looking at in some of the research, is what I call commander's intent, which is the way that West Point has been training officers in the 70s. Where, and actually, it's, if you look back to um, Lincoln and Sherman, and Sherman and uh, Jackson, who was the guy, it's always the case where you, as a commander, you tell them what objectives you want to achieve, and when or how much you want that objective achieved and you leave it to the person you're giving the commander, command to to figure out how to do it. And so you can have multi-level commander's intent, right? And how do you do commander's intent? Well, I like to do like a math programming problem because you have clear objectives and clear constraints. So last but not least, in aviation, we certify people as well. And we certify humans. And as your former dean of engineering told me, because this happened to him, Mike Bragg, when he was doing his flight check as a 16-year-old, the inspector opened the door of the airplane while he was running down the runway for takeoff. And he said, what do you think they were trying to test, JP? And he's like, well, we're trying to tell you if you actually know your airplane to know whether that open door was going to make a difference to the aerodynamics that much to basically understand what was going on and whether there was easy corrective action to be taken to mitigate that issue.
issue. So getting the point is that you want to basically figure out, could we do that? Could we measure this decision making a priori and basically show that we achieve some target level of safety, which is what we have implicit. So my argument is follow. This is a very Asimovian view of the world that an agent and especially a machine agent or a human agent has measurable objectives and first knows themselves and their environment. So I was telling to Karen earlier, we know as people in all walks of life who are brilliant at what they do, their IQ is off the chart, but their EQ is close to zero. And in many cases, those folks can easily let up, be led astray, right? Because why? While they're really good at solving a particular problem, they're not good at estimating the environment that they're in. That emotional quotient, that ability to read people, not there, right? And they can be easily led astray. So the first thing is that when you try to evaluate humans, what we actually do when we're thinking about those kids, that we have to decide whether to give the keys or not, is can they tell the difference between somebody who's going to do them harm and somebody who has their goodwill and their intent, right? That's an estimation problem, right? And that's true not only about them, and they also know is do they have the strength, do you think they have the strength of courage internally to actually know when things are going to go bad for them and make that decision? So it's an estimation problem. And by the way, we can do the same for machines, right? Um, I, 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 I love this one with Jarvis, you know, of Iron Man, which is uh, everybody loves, right? And uh, I can't remember which Iron Man movie where Iron Man was going straight up into the atmosphere, way, way, way into space, and he was about to lose control, and he said, uh, Jarvis said, uh, Tony, you're about to lose uh, control. And he's like, no, no, no. I was like, and, and what, did, what did Tony Stark said? He says, how confident are you? And Jarvis said, I'm about 99% sure that I'm going to lose. And then Jarvis shut the Iron Man suit down just before he went on and recovered it afterwards. So the point is, machines have good estimates. They're mathematical estimates, right? And you can interrogate them, or you can actually design them to give you those estimates. How confident are they in their estimates? And so that's a way for you to do judgment. And if, you know, the truth is, if something is 99% right about estimating the true state, in all the conditions you have test them. That's a system that should be trusted. If it's only 50%, well, don't trust it that much. The other thing, of course, is do no harm. And this is defining state action sets, right? And you do the state action sets that do no harm, and the state action set, protect yourself, right? And the fact of the matter is, you can actually train systems and interrogate and evaluate systems on all three of these things. And if they score 100% on this and 100% on that and 100% on that, for, all, for a wide array of things, all the things you could think about, that's a system you can trust, right? But if they start to falter on any one of those, you have to start thinking about how much trust should you give them and what operating conditions do you have to limit them based on the implications of that, the trust that you have. So machine agents like humans can define a set of actions that maximize the likelihood of success while minimizing the risk of failure, right? And in a sense, if you think about it, I know this is a sort of logical discussion argument thing, but we're working on the math. You can evaluate machines, and that's how we evaluate humans. And going back to the endurance example, think about that robot sitting on Mars or sitting on the moon, or moon specifically, or sitting on any planet for a whole day while you're deciding. If you have maps, albeit maps with great uncertainty, you can define a state action set that is guaranteed to whatever level you want to keep the vehicle safe. And if your objective is exploration, why not let the vehicle explore? Especially if you can set it up for even better exploration based on the data that you went set down before. So machine agent, can do estimation, you can measure their accuracy, enumerate options, and estimate effectiveness, and of course, you can 
create a stochastic program to basically determine what best to do. So one way to do that, of course, is Monte Carlo, or you can use machine learning as well, um, both in the learning side as well as in the decision-making side. So the question then leads to, now we have a machine, and the machine can do its estimation and tell you, like Jarvis, who should take control, right? My answer to the question, who should be in charge? The agent with the best solution. Right? And Jarvis knew that, he had, that it had the best solution, sorry. And so it basically said, look, forget about you, Tony. I'm going to shut you down because this is the best solution. And if you look back at that report I talked about, this was, uh, we talked about the vision for increased autonomy in civil aviation, and we talk about the fact that we see a mix of crew and unmanned vehicles operating in the shared airspace. And basically, the committee's vision for increased automatic crew aircraft is that the crew will be able to perform existing proposed and potential tasks because the increasingly autonomous um, systems will provide predictors of failure and with the limits of authority grant in particular, intervene when necessary. So this is back to 2014. We actually put it down on paper in the National Academy report that we envision that you can intervene when necessary. And so, and basically, this is the point I'm saying, onboard systems will be able to intervene. Now you're going to say, that sounds scary. But I can give you at least one example that I know with 100% certainty is one where I would prefer the machine to inter intervene. So there's a thing in aviation called stabilized approaches. Anybody ever heard about that? You need to be within a landing configuration within certain tolerances by a certain altitude. And if you are not stabilized by that point, you should execute a missed approach. Humans are notorious for being irrational egoists, as in overzealous and overconfident in their abilities, and not being stabilized and trying to make landings after not being stabilized. The other thing about humans is that they often learn or figure out very late in the game that they're not going to be stabilized, often after they're reached non-stabilized. Machines can estimate way better and could actually execute missed approaches basically well before you re descend to the point where you are already unstabilized and actually pull the airplane in a go around, which would actually be safer for everybody, including the following aircraft, because it actually could increase efficiency. So there is one case where you'd like the machine to take over. Now, I, driving a car, I don't like the lane correction feature. I much like the lane, lane warning feature as about correction. That one I'm not so sure about the machine taking over because sometimes you have some other objectives. But within the landing problem, which is well defined, right, there is a case where you want the machine to take over from the human. So now that I've talked about the landing problem, I'm going to go into the specifics of a problem which is not the same as I talked about but is related to landing where you could actually have the machine basically take over and do what the human now does. So as many of you know, there are a lot of uncrewed remotely piloted aircraft being proposed or being developed. I think there's a ton of eVTOL companies. There are companies like X-Wing that are proposing automatic approach and landing and, and all uh, different things, and especially for cargo operations, especially X-Wing. And one of the big challenges there is executing or determining whether to execute a missed approach or not. So right now, uh, if you're going to land in SeaTac on a day when there's fog, right, or bad weather or low clouds, either one, airplanes are either equipped to Cat 1, Cat 2, or Cat 3 criteria. I think Seattle has a Cat 3 because you have bad enough weather. But most airports are only equipped to Cat 2. Why? Because it's very expensive to keep your pilots trained to CAT3 criteria, to have your ground systems calibrated, right? And you also, also have to line up much further out on the extended um, um, direction of the runway for CAT3 than the CAT2 or CAT1, right? So you can't do those 
cutting curves to come into the airport. All of these things together, plus you have to keep trucks and other airplanes further from the runway, the ILS system, and all the different systems to basically meet them things. So, all procedures so far have been certified with human over on board, right? And the reason is because you want to have additional layer for monitoring and intervening when you have um, disruptions. So what happens when the human is removing the vehicle? So for example, you put a pilot on a ground control station, or you have multiple pilots operating a fleet of N aircraft at M to N, or you have a single manager controlling multiple aircraft. So these are all things that people have proposed. How must we allocate the automation and the human to maintain the desired level of safety? And what's the desired level of safety? One in a billion. That's all you got to remember, right? If anything is less than one in a billion, it doesn't happen. That's our, cut, that's our threshold in the aviation, right? So you want to have all failures that are not extremely improbable must be analyzed and mitigated to an act acceptable level, and it's interpreted as one in a billion. So, let's look about the humans in a ground control station. Well, um, the command and control link becomes an important thing. In space, it's the same thing, right? Every spacecraft has a safe mode. And what's the safe mode? It's usually something that you can go to. It has control in very limited operating conditions and very little actuate actions possible for a finite amount of time. So one of the things you have to ask about autonomy is, I want an autonomous system. What's the first question you need to add, ask? For how long? Because autonomy for the next hour is a lot different for autonomy for all future time. Right? So you need to ask that question. So if you actually have comms, you can come up with a whole bunch of things called required link performance, which talks about, which is analogous to required navigation performance for those of you in navigation, which says how well the airplane has to track a tube. You can have those requirements for transaction time, continuity, availability, and integrity, which are the classic definitions for comm links. So the maximum time it takes to complete a transaction, continuity, basically the minimum um, Proportion of communication transaction with a specified RLP transaction time. The availability, that if you randomly call on it, it's going to be there. And of course, integrity um, with no errors during the transaction. So these are the, you can specify requirements on all of these. However, in the end, none of these is perfect. And so if I put somebody on the ground or people on the ground to M to N or 1 to N or 1 to 1, you can be sure with a very high confidence that at some point they're going to lose their C2 link. And so, inspired by the space problem, the question then is how much autonomy do you need? It has to be based on and complementary to your required link performance. And so, we are looking at a concept of extending this principle to be a combined RLP and a required autonomy performance as well. And the two together must get your target level of safety with 10 to the minus nine. So if your comm links are not reliable, so imagine flying around downtown Seattle where you're going to fly by a building that's going to block your comm or block your surveillance, you need to be able to have enough autonomy performance to be able to survive those blockages. And the frequency, duration, et cetera, errors introduced have to be complemented by proper autonomy on the, other, on the other side. So this L2 loss requires some level of decision making on board airplanes. So you know, one of the things that airplanes that we do with pilots now is we squawk a code to alert ATC if you don't get linked back a certain time, and then after interval, the basically aircraft has a pre-programmed last link procedure. Right. And every airplane that leaves Seattle everywhere, when they go to their destination, they have what they call a VM leg, which is basically a provably safe leg that they can stay on if they lose comms. 
which gives them the time to figure out and try to get back. And if they don't get back in a certain time, they basically have a procedure that they know they can go to here. That's a, what I call passively safe. And so you're going to need autonomous detect and avoid in basically congested areas. And you basically need, a, on the final approach, you, you have to degrade the ability to mitigate these things. And so the question then, which I'm going to get to for the specific example I'm going to talk about, is what lasting procedure and the auto onboard decision making do we need to final approach to get to my 10 to the minus 9? And on final approach, this is where I'm going to focus the rest of my talk, is a hard problem. And it's an important problem because this is where most of the accidents happen. Right? You're coming close to the ground, you're descending towards the ground. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, almost like a controlled crash, right? So you're going towards the ground and you basically flare at the very end to arrest your descent. And if you're a really great pilot, the stall warning goes off just as your wheel's touching down. Right? And so what I was talking about earlier, you see that you have a cat one where you have, have to make a decision to descend if we're going to execute a missed approach or continue at 200 feet. And 1,800 feet, runway visibility range, you got to see down the runway, uh, 1,800 feet. Or CAT 2 is 100 and 1,200, and then CAT 3 you have 50 and 700, and it continues down to CAT 3C, which is 0, 0, the airplane lands itself. Going from this to CAT 3C, big difference in the requirements on the terrestrial systems. So I'm going to say something now is probably controversial. I have never seen... 10 to the minus 9 achieved on a vehicle with any number of sensors without something on the ground to actually provide additional C and S, communication, navigation, navigation, and surveillance. And the way we do it in aviation is we actually have an instrument landing system which provides a path descending. We have obstacle clearance zones to keep buildings out. Right? We have whole short lines to keep other planes away from the ILS so that it doesn't interfere with the, tra the wave. And we also have a lot of procedures, both in the cockpit and on the ground, that together give you 10 to the minus 9. Because no one system, no one component of the system can give you that. And so the question is, when I take the pilot, so one example, um, which I love to show, is this one in Queenstown, New Zealand where the airport is in this valley. And before we had RNP, we had precision tracking, and you had to basically be able to see the airport from before you descend in the valley. Otherwise, you couldn't descend. Why? Because when you descended, if you had to come out, you had no guarantee you could get out because the missed approach guidance wasn't there. And so what they did with the RNP, they were able to carry the minimums down to accept low minimums, you know, basically 14, 1,470 feet is basically, touchdown zone is 1,160 feet, so that's basically 310 feet, a reasonably low decision height, by basically having an RNP procedure that you could follow like breadcrumbs out of that valley. Just like a human, if you're going to somewhere you don't know, leave some breadcrumbs, so that if you want to get out, you can get out. Right? And so the question then, could we replace the pilot with a machine? And there's an old adage in aviation, you can continue on your current path as long as you have a safe backup. And the moment you're about to lose your last good option, that's the time to abort. Right? And if you think about landing, as you descend, right? you're basically, and that decision height about 200 feet or 100 or whatever, is computed such that given all the systems you have, your error won't grow fast enough that if you execute the mist, right, you're going to have problems. So you, you're basically trying to find that spot, that height, where I can descend, given all the terrain, given all the equipment I have, I can have a safe path out. I still have my breadcrumbs, right? But we do that calculation a priori, and that's all based on our target level of safety. The question is, if I don't have the human in there, could I basically say, okay, I'm going to have cameras and detection of all the runway and look to see how far I can do all the runway and repeat 
what the pilot does, or do I go back to the function that I'm trying to achieve, target level of safety? And I'll just say one thing, because I'm going to skip a couple slides here. Every time I teach systems engineering, I give my students this problem. It becomes harder and harder every year. I explain to them how you change a stick shift. How you listen to the revs, you look at the tachometer, you look at the speed, you feel the vibrations in the gears and in the, in the clutch pedal, and you find this magical thing, and then you sink the clutch pedal and you shift the gear. Then I ask them, we want to automate this. And inevitably, half the class says, well, we need to have a microphone, we need migration meters, we need all these things because they want to replicate what the human does. And then the other half says, you know what? We're just trying to land the speed in the gearbox so I can merge these two things. I can do it down there with some good LIDARs or whatever sense rotation sensors and basically do that automatic change differently. The, I say that to say this, that there are lots of people working on forward-looking infrared systems and things to figure out where the runway lights are and where the runway is and how clear the runway is to replicate that 200 mission meter decision, feet decision height or 100, whatever it is. When we have GPS and we have all these other systems that would allow us, if we can compute in real time, the target level of safety, determine whether we should continue on our approach or abort, okay? So um, we basically formulated all of this that decision for the runway, and we actually modeled it uh, with a fast time simulation of a 737-800 with a Dryden Gus model, all the different things. We looked at the different failures, and we said, we designed an agent that in real time did rare event estimation. That at every instant, if you had like a one second update, every second it would determine Am I going to lose my best option, as my last option within the next second? If not, I can continue. And then it's always looking ahead to say, can I make it to the runway? Can I make it to the runway? And the moment I'm either going to lose my best option and cannot make it to the runway, I execute a missed approach. Or if I can make it to the runway, I just keep going. Right? And that's what the human does when they see the runway, right? The uncertainty is building up in the fog. And then all of a sudden you see the runway. What happens then? Your uncertainty goes down to zero. Doesn't mean you can completely land it. The uncertainty is, am I going to make it or am I not? And if you're not, you're going to execute a miss. If you are, you continue, right? We're replicating the same decision. Am I going to make it or am I going to lose my option? But we're doing it in a different way. So we did, and in the interest of time, sorry, I won't go into the math, but we basically, you know, modeled the initial the probability distribution as our uh, PDF, sorry, and we used um, basically a different uh, distribution to estimate the probability of an accident, and we basically figured out how to minimize um, the variance um, of distributions, and I'll probably, the bottom line is, I'll skip to this, we parameterize distribution, we quantify the difference in distribution through a kullback -Lieber, um, liebler divergence criteria um, equation, and then we basically differentiated it and came up with a, basically a likelihood function. What that means is, the bottom line is, we were able using this distribution to nudge the sampling in our Monte Carlo to the rare events that really matter. And so we could compute in a very short time, right, whether or not the probability was going to be above or below 10 to the minus 9. Because if you do it with a straight Monte Carlo or a straight distribution, it's going to take a long time. So this accelerates the process. And so we did that, and we came up with an analytical distribution for how to nudge these, these samples down to the rare events that are going to be the problem. And what we were able to find was that we could, looking at different capabilities in the system, in real time compute basically the probability that you're going to basically lose your 
alternate or continue. And we could actually, for any given target level of safety, let's say there was 10 to the minus 7, determine when to make your decision about missed approaches. So, which I think is kind of cool, because the thing is that that's one of the things that's been a holdup in Autoland, which is who makes a decision about missed approach. Because if you lose the calm, right, you can't do it. So, with that said, I want to have a few closing thoughts, which I think sort of capture the spirit of my thinking. So, as I just showed, we can replace a, machine, a human with an autonomous machine if we can define a target level of safety and deter, have a process to determine how safe it is in real time. And then we can a priori evaluate decision making of the autonomous agent. So not only can we evaluate their decision making, but we can also implement those decisions in real time and, and actually see them work and guarantee your target level of safety. Now, the other thing is machine agents can make decisions over multiple time periods. And both human machine independent can determine the confidence they have in their proposed solutions, right? And like Jarvis, right, we have a whole field of explainable AI. My point is, why are we asking machines to explain things in human languages, which are very complex, when we actually know math? Or at least most of us know math. Everybody in this room knows math, but not, I can't say that for everybody who knows math everywhere in the world. But the fact of the matter is, you know, Tony Stark didn't ask Jarvis to explain, you know, how did you come to your decision? I mean, we've all who are working in control be like, we want, explain, we want people to, machines to explain how they come to the decision. Tony Stark just asked Jarvis, how confident are you? Right? And going back to this human analogy, which is, as you can see, is the thread of my inspiration for this. How do we judge people's confidence? You look them, you look at their reaction, body, face. If I'm a pilot flying and somebody's flying with you, you basically look over and if they look shaken, you probably don't trust them, right? However, that is not a requirement for a machine, and a machine should not be asked to do something similar, right? A requirement for a machine is tell you what is their estimate, what is their confidence interval, right? Are you 99.6% sure? And I can look and say, how confident are you? I'm 99% sure, and I'm like, well, I'm only 50% sure, so I'm going to go with you. Right? And so I think... This is an area where we really need to take a look. Probably not me, because it's not really my area, but which is on the psychology of this with humans and machines, right? And what's the right breakpoint about asking them to explain their decisions versus asking them how confident they are in their decisions? And uh, with that, I will stop and uh, take questions. Um, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that it's about uh, <clears throat> to make the, the to, to be in control, you have to know yourself. Yes. So sensors. Yes. To me, one of the biggest challenges, but you kind of alluded it later a little bit, yeah. is that we all think the best sensors for our autonomous cars are all these cameras. Yes. I think it's different for airplanes. Yes. What are the but it's different for cars, too. I, 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 right, as yeah. we found out mm -hmm. yeah. that um, cameras alone does not make the autonomous vehicle. Right. Nor mm -hmm. even multi-sensors alone right. together make the autonomous vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's a whole thing about, you know, public infrastructure network nodes around cities to help provide comms and additional surveillance from a different point of view, which you, which you I mean, you know, Driving a car for, with humans, I hate to tell people, but not as safe as you think it is. I mean, we always think it is because we always overestimate our own abilities. Um, that, that, that won't happen to us because we're great drivers. Um, but the truth is you need to have other sensors on board outside of the vehicle 
to, to, to get that. And so even with the best sensors on the vehicle, right, you're not going to achieve that target. I mean, depends on what target level of safety you want. How about in airplanes? How about in airplanes? I, I don't, still don't think you're going to have the target level of safety. So I'll give you one example. So even if you do an RVR of 1,800, you can, if you're landing in somewhere out in the boonies in some country that's underdeveloped, even if they have an ILS, and you go down to 200 feet and 1,800 RVR, you can't see the cow on the other end of the runway. Right? And so one thing that you don't see is the mitigation action of the pilot who's going to decide whether to Dive, I mean, diverge off the runway when they've landed if there's a cow walking across. By the way, we have that in Alaska too and other places with animals. And places where they don't have fences around airports, right? Animals walk across runways all the time, right? That's not considered in the safety analysis, but that's a practical thing that you need to have. So one example for that, you could have LIDAR or laser-based or some kind of sensor on the airport surface to actually give your entire, the airport is clear, right? And then you combine that with uh, something on, on board for, for getting much higher precision, and you can check, is the runway clear? That's somebody, another sensor equipment that's providing that, and together give you the target level of safety that you need. Okay. Thank you. So uh, on, the, on your last point about uh, how to verify the, the, the decision by asking how confident the machine yeah. is, but how do you verify the uncertainty of the machine? How do you verify uh, the confidence of the machine, it's only confidence. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. yeah no, no, I, no, I wouldn't. Because I've already tested, remember, I've already tested the machine a priori. Right? So you need to have a, like, a very uh, uh, faithful model of the... Well, no, well, you have to have, it does not, the point is, you have to have good sensor or estimation ability, which you have tested beforehand. And you have to have a good ability to see the set of safe actions to take, or the set, feasible set or acceptable set of actions to take. Right? You can't guarantee to 100% that they're going to pick a safe action. Right? You can only evaluate how good they are at picking good actions. And we're asking machines to do things that we never ask humans to do. Because we, again, like I said, I've never seen anybody with a human, well, maybe some, go down with all the list of everything that might happen in your life and ask you, how would you act in this situation? What would you do? What? And then say, okay, you're now certified. Boom. We don't ask people that. We observe, we interrogate, but we actually test. You know, I always tell people, you can pass a qualifying exam with not getting a perfectly correct answer. Because what are we testing in a qualifying exam? Not whether you memorize stuff. We're testing how you think, your decision-making process, how you formulate a problem, how when you don't have something that you didn't get taught, you extrapolate and do the things that you have thought to bring in new knowledge, right? These are all the things that we're doing in another way here, right? And so I'm, I've been really, I mean, you know, the, the whole thing about the explainable AI was the thing that got me thinking about this thing. Because I'm like, we're asking machines to do things that we don't ask humans to do. And in ways that we don't ask humans to do. Right? And so we need to really think about it in the way that we can properly interrogate and evaluate a machine. And, and then just start thinking about how do we really evaluate humans? And it turns out not very much dissimilar to how we would evaluate a machine, but it's, for us, it's unconscious, right? You don't sit down at home thinking, ah, what's my sensing ability of my kid relative to the person at their school who is going to lead them astray, right? But if your kid comes home and says, you know, I really don't like Johnny because I think Johnny is rude, and I think because for this reason, you're like, I trust that kid. <laughs> that kid knows what's up, right? So the point about it is testing decision-making ability, which for me breaks down to estimation of state, 
and identification of feasible actions is really what we want to be doing for machines. A follow-on question, and I think what Amir is, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, there are uh, uncertainty associated with each sensor in yes. the network, uh, with the engine, for example. Yep. With, so how do you assess the collective uncertainty be based on multiple, all these, uh, multiple right. uncertainties within right. the network? Well, that's, so, that's how you basically articulate your testing plan. I didn't say that they, it, I mean, I, I, it's not going to be exhaustive because it can be, but it can be representative, right? I mean, we don't prepare soldiers or we don't prepare pilots for every condition that could happen, right? And, and what we do is we actually, <laughs> turns out, limit their ability, just like a human, we limit the pilot. So a pilot gets a private license, right? <clears throat> they can't fly in bad weather. They have to fly with sunshine. They can't fly in IFR conditions. They have to get all these different things. They can't do all these things. And as they build up confidence and they get evaluated, right, for the next case, they can fly IFR. And then they can fly commercial. And then they can fly ATP, right? And so the point is that you need to test them in a representative sample. And you, they, 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 they remember the trust is the precursor to the number of autonomy that you give them. And so the idea would be that you, just like the ETOPS, you test them, for, trust them for a bit, collect the data. As you get more confident, then you give them more op op autonomous operation. And that's the loop that you would do. I mean, if you want to do it all in one soup, then you have to do a very much extensive program. But the framework is flexible enough that you can say, let me test over these conditions, right, and make sure that they're doing these three things under those, you gather more information and statistics, then you evaluate them, and then you gradually expand their operation. Just like the kid, test, trust a little, freedom a little. Trust a little, freedom a little. Um, so I had a question similar to that. So um, a lot of the times when I hear autonomy talked about in aircraft, it's yeah. kind of like all or nothing, where either you have like no pilots in the airplane or two pilots, mm -hmm. right? For transport aircraft. Is there like an approach that people are taking where the aircraft is able to do basic things autonomously, like a repositioning flight by itself, mm -hmm. but then when there's passengers on board, the aircraft are more like, are piloted by, you know, real pilots, and then at some point in there, once sufficient data is collected, data is collected yeah. then you could go on and... Yes. Um, yes. So that's the approach that X-Wing is taking. Okay. So X-Wing basically has their autonomous system on board their aircraft. They're doing cargo operations for FedEx and others. So they're flying into small airports, which, you know, with the small caravans. And what they've been doing is basically having pilots fly, collecting the data in shadow mode on their autonomous system. And then as they get more and more data to prove to the FAA that they can actually do it, then they're going to more autonomous operations in those cargo situations. And then that will then prove that they can do other things so they can move on to, say, single pilot, and then on to the pilot. I mean, their, their systems are mostly autonomous operation as opposed to autonomous decision making. But it's still the same approach, which is to you know, collect the data to prove the stuff. Just like ETOPS, and as you get more and more data, give more and more autonomy of operation. Have more questions come up and ask. We'll be here for a little bit longer before they head out to dinner. So, thank you again.